This is an HR program on demand, a living seed capsule of work life and workplace coming live from a rooftop in Stockholm, Sweden. It's me, Anne-Marie Andrich, and me, Katarina Berg. A vodcast, if you like, on HR, straight across the counter. Sponsored by HR, the real deal, HR by HR for HR. Hello, Katie. Hello. Welcome to Stockholm. Thank you very much. All the way from New York. Yes. Yes. I'm so excited to have you join us today and to get to know you because I think you have a very interesting background. I hope so. And um, why, don't, why don't we start with you sharing what your role is, what you do at Spotify, and then we'll backtrack that a bit. That sounds great. Great. So I um, am the HRBP across our global units, um, which some people would call support functions or central functions. So I support our CFO, our chief HR officer, Katarina, um, our general counsel, and our chief public affairs officer. Um, I've been in this role for about two years. I've been at Spotify for about five years overall. Um, and was uh, working, supporting in our content organization as an HRVP before that. Exactly. And you actually joined through an acquisition, right? I did. Yeah. I did. I sort of snuck into Spotify unnoticed. Um, <laughs> so uh, I worked for a podcast startup um, starting in 2016 that was ultimately acquired by Spotify in 2019 called Gimlet. Um and spent my time in those few years as a one woman band, one woman HR band, ultimately two women, but mostly one woman HR band. Um, I joined when Gimlet was about 20 people and we got acquired at about 130, 150 people. Um, so it wasn't an enormous company by any means, but we did a whole lot of growing um, in that time. Um, and then after the acquisition, I got the awesome opportunity to join the HRVP team uh, supporting the podcast studio and the content unit. Fantastic. Yes. That's, that's a big, uh, it's an interesting leap, I think. Yes. Yeah. Professionally, it must have been, right? <laughs> yes. It was, it was a huge, uh, a huge jump, uh, a big learning curve. I was, it was helpful that prior to working at the startup, I had worked in bigger, more traditional media companies. So in more of a traditional HR setup um, with, with a bigger team and a bigger organization. But um, I wanted to see what it was like to sort of do it from the ground up. And I very much got that experience and then uh, went back to being in a bigger organization with more resources and more support, but a much more sophisticated strategy, a much more sophisticated business model operation, you name it, sort of orders of magnitude, uh, bigger and more complex. Exactly. Wonderful. So I think you haven't, um, and, and thank you for sharing uh, your background. Um, I brought you along because... I made a few observations, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, but I'd like to test a few um, of those ob observations with you and see, you know, if you've seen the same things or maybe you haven't. So let's have a conversation <laughs> about that. But I think, you know, th there are always trends. The trends come and yep. go, right? And I think our profession is uh, a profession that um, through the past few years have become um much more top of mind maybe than mm -hmm. we were earlier with uh, with um, uh, driving the business and partnering with business leaders yep. uh, in, in growing uh, businesses and organizations. Now, obviously, we in HR, we know that we were always part of that journey, right? <laughs> but I think there were a few things that actually accelerated that awareness, yeah. if, we, if I put it like that. Yep. With that, I also think that there has been some interesting... Um, development on the view on HR. Yeah. Um, it seems like now when you say that you have the title HRBP or Chief HR Officer, that that is um, more or less thought as, well, that's the boring stuff of HR. That's the transactional part. Yeah. But if you have a title that says people and culture, or something else, then the notion is that, well, this is where the more business-driven HR or the more strategic HR is done. Yep. Right? I agree with that, Steve. I, I very much agree with that, and I've observed that as well. So what is that? It's interesting. I think over the last however many years, five, ten years, I think especially in the last five years, as HR has gotten to 
has gotten a little bit more sort of bigger seat at the table, more top of mind, part of the narrative, more CHROs becoming CEOs, people realizing that they, leaders especially realizing that they really need a strong HR function in their organization. Um, HR as a function has gotten more uh, strategic and has gotten more recognition. And it's funny because I almost think that as the external perception of HR has gotten maybe a little bit more high profile or a little bit more interesting or being viewed in a different way, the internal perception from the people who are actually practitioners or want to be practitioners has gotten to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more sort of split or people are sort of starting to see, ooh, as there is more interesting work to do in front of more important people in bigger forums, that's where I want to be. Right. And I think you see more um, people and even organizations and leaders who, uh, you know, also want to hold up their wonderful HR and, and people and culture organization say, we are strategic, yes. we are thoughtful, we are forward thinking, we are provocative. Um, but it's really, really hard to be that when you are sitting on a foundation made out of nothing. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. Made out of nothing, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I thank you. So my observation is um, I'm not the only one, right? And oh, I'm clearly, yep. it, it, is a, it is a conversation that we're having, um, you know, um, in the function. Yeah. Uh, and I just wanted to raise this with you because I also know that given your journey um, and advancing in, in yep. your profession, I know that you had some some hard learnings as well. Yes. So, and, and I'll ask you in, in a sec to share with us uh, what that was. But I think just to, just to emphasize, uh, you, and use the house as some sort of metaphor, you cannot build the house with a roof, right? You have to build it from scratch and from the foundation, right? Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes we, we just fool ourselves. Uh, you know, the house will fall apart if you don't have those boring yes. stuff in place, yes. right? You cannot be uh, strategic with anything within the, 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 the people strategy if you actually don't have a robust foundation. Right. Now, back to you, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, uh, you mentioned to me earlier offline, you said, uh, yeah, I actually had, um, I had an interesting learning uh, on that yep. uh, in your career. Why yep. don't you share with us? So I started my career in, in recruitment and TA and um, always sort of saw being on the HR partnership side as being sort of the more exciting opportunity. I eventually made my way over into sort of a very junior generalist HRVP role. And I, I felt like that was a very hard one. Like, yes, I, had, I now am a, um, an HRVP. But pretty quickly, I started to realize I'm in a very, very execution focused role. I'm very much a generalist. I'm very much answering basic questions. I am very much doing the meat and potatoes. And so I started to feel like, oh, HR is the, is the unsexy or uncool thing to have in your title, even though there was a point in time in which I thought that was cool. Then I got it and I was like, oh man, I'm not doing that much. I'm not sitting in front of the important people. I'm not in the big room that I want to be in. I was also very young and very early in my career. No way should I have been in those rooms regardless. But um, so that was sort of like the first part of my career in the bigger sort of more traditional media companies that I was in. And then I got to a point where I said, it would be really cool to go build something from scratch. And I got an opportunity at a startup. And that was when I really got some cold water splashed on my face about just how important the basics were yeah. and just how critical it was that I had spent the previous years doing the basics, getting, getting my repetitions in, learning the foundations, learning the building blocks, learning the theory, learning the principles, because it was all systems go as soon as I joined. So I yeah. was a one woman recruiter. I was a one woman HRBP. I was a one woman comp and bend person. I was a one woman learning and development person. I was a, a one woman DEIB professional. It was like truly being at the center of all of the HR functions, which was super exhilarating and fun. But you realize very quickly what you don't know, right? <laughs> exactly. which is a lot. Yeah. And I think that those three years that I spent, three or four years that I spent in the startup, gave me a huge appreciation for the basics that I knew that I sort of had gotten to the point where I was like, this doesn't feel so exciting. And of course, my title at the startup was people, you know, head of people operations and people and culture. And it yeah. had sort of the title that made me say, oh, yeah, this is great. Like, I'm, I'm doing the cool like I love I was so excited to tell people that I was, you know, 
head of people at a startup instead of HR generalist or HR business partner at a, you know, an older company. But I never, ever, ever in a million years would have been able to do a week's worth of work at, at the startup had I not spent that time getting all those repetitions in. And so by the time I got to the end of my startup time, I really was starting to see like this whole people moniker, this whole thing, it is branding and nothing else because underneath it is, is an extraordinary amount of execution, an extraordinary amount of uh, building your knowledge base. Sometimes it's really exciting and exhilarating and strategic, and sometimes it is incredibly boring. Sometimes it is manual comp review in a spreadsheet for 150 people. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's you know sitting in a room with founders and coming up with a with a bigger strategy. And so, but it it really it really taught me a lesson about just how critical the foundation was. Yeah. And you know, had I had I painted a you know, had I not had that foundation, I think the house that I had built would have looked very nice and pretty from the outside and you would have opened the front door and fallen directly into the dirt on your face. Mm -hmm. And that would not have worked out terribly well. So mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for sort of the real execution operational baseline that helped me be so much more strategic down the road. Wonderful. So what would be your, because we also know that, I mean, there are so many ambitious uh, people who are in the, you know, the, 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 the start of their career, and mm -hmm. especially in our field, right? What would be your uh, recommendations? If someone wants to grow into a generalist role, yep. into an HRBP role, how do you build that curriculum for yourself in the best possible way? I think it's to get yourself as exposed to as much as you possibly can in the HR space, yep. because what you're building towards if you want to be an HR business partner is you're building towards being the person that the business or the executive that you support or the team of executives that you support goes to with with ultimate faith and confidence to help steer their organization. And so you need to be able to speak credibly about compensation, about recruitment, about operations, about labor law, about all of these things, because ultimately you don't want to be the person who the CFO turns to they ask you a pretty basic HR question and you can't answer it. Because, yeah. Because that will really very quickly undermine your credibility and their trust in you. It's like if, you know, if we're going back to the house analogy, it's like, you know, you hire a contractor who's going to be by your side building this huge, beautiful thing from scratch and you ask them a very basic question about a building code or which materials should we use? And they brush it off and say, uh, I'm not sure, but there's someone somewhere on my team who can answer that question. Yeah. I lose a little bit of faith in that person because I want to know that they have the experience, the sort of hard won experience, both by succeeding and failing, but ultimately have that sort of base of knowledge that they can be a super credible leader, but also know how to lead the people underneath them and build those people up so that you just have a rock solid team. So it comes from doing the stuff that doesn't seem super exciting, but at the end of the day makes you a bulletproof senior partner who just has incredible, you know, who just has a ton of credibility. Exactly. Uh, and I think that also builds that robust robustness and you also feel grounded yes. because you know what you're talking about, right? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I think there are a and lot don't of rush it. Yeah, and don't, don't rush it. Don't rush it. And I think there are, there. you know, going thinking back to sort of the, especially the tech industry, there is often an arms race to sort of say like, well, who has the best, you know, employer branding or who has, you know, there, there there's so much that you have to present externally as an organization that has to do with HR. And I think there are a lot of companies out there and a lot of HR professionals who sort of choose to say, I'm going to jump to this to this place. I'm going to jump to the program building, the branding, the um, sort of the stuff that makes us look that makes us look really progressive and thoughtful and interesting. But I think some the risk with that is you end up missing a lot of the steps along the way. Yes. And sometimes you get away with it and sometimes you don't. And yeah. um, I think more often than not, you don't. And that can be that can be really challenging. But you've painted this wonderful sort of outward looking um, facade if you will but again inside you open the door <laughs> you fall you you fall you straight, fall straight in exactly and, um, yeah exactly and i think um I, I know that katarina uses the the metaphor of our um 
our profession saying there are 171 colors of yes. the HR palette. Yes. That's quite a few colors, right? Yes. And, uh, and I think if we, if we just have that patience um, and we understand that our job is rather complex um, and it's so challenging and it's so fun um, and there are quite a yeah. few colors there, yes. right? And you have a long career ahead of you. There's yeah. a lot of time to build the colors on the palette and to really be intentional about what you learn and also to take advantage of all the opportunities that come your way because it may be that you get an opportunity to go do a stint in an ops team, for example, and you may say, okay, well, that seems like it deviates a little bit from my path to being a strategic HR leader. Mm -hmm. But the reality is you can't be a strategic HR leader if you don't spend the time in that ops, in that ops capacity because one day your CEO will turn to you and be say, okay, great, strategic CHRO. Yes. How are you going to operationalize me. this? Exactly. And you have to be able to give a credible answer. Yeah, wonderful. And quoting Katarina again as we close this is to say, good HR is good HR, bad H HR is bad HR. It doesn't matter how we title it. It doesn't change with the title. Oh, totally. Yeah? 100%. Cool. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Love it. <laughs> I feel so refreshed and invigorated between the conversation and the air and the snow and the sunset. It's lovely. Yeah. Uh, hopefully next time when you join, um, it will not be a freezing cold. <laughs> Thank you so much for a, a great chat uh, and your insights into this um, um, topic that I think will continue. Great. So shall we close it? We shall. Okay. The three things. Yes. Stay, stay safe, safe. Stay strong. Stay, stay active. Ida modalia. What she said. <laughs> What she said. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> uh, um, you know, something has been on my mind for quite some time now, and it's like it's much more it's much more fancier. What What do you think? Right. That sounds yeah? great. Okay. Cool. Ida Modalia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I was just looking at your tears and I'm like, oh, am I? Oh, am I? I this always happens to me. It's like people come inside and I come inside and people are like, what happened? And I'm like, yeah. what do you mean? It's not like you're crying. It's, uh, it's the no, way. and it's funny because I don't even feel it. It's like very, um, yeah, it's, it's because you're there, so but then cold. of course I you're wipe numb. my face and I'm like, oh, yeah, you're of course, numb. there we go. Text Nella.